Let's close our eyes. Bow our hearts. Precious and merciful Lord, we adore you. We love you. We can't wait to hear from your word this morning. Not from any man, not from any woman, but your word that is alive and that is current, that is never outdated, that is right in the right time. Speak to our hearts, speak to us and transform our lives, Lord Jesus. Our hearts are yielded unto you, Holy Spirit. Take over. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It's true. Um, he's coming soon. Very consistent. Amen. Very consistent word. Uh, so we have been studying the prophets. And sometimes you think, you know, why do we study the prophets? They came so long ago. They're old-fashioned. They don't have anything current. But if you look at his word, there is nothing outdated. There is nothing out of season. There is nothing that is not relevant. And really, God has aligned it in the right time, in the right season for the right people. And he is coming soon. He warned them then, and he wants us now. This was, this was always the, 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 the role of the prophet was to say something that was current um, in the season for the people that he spoke to at that time, and uh, also a message for what was going to come in the time of tribulation, in the time of the Lord coming again. It was current then. It is current now. So I pray you receive it because there is a word in this for us, for our nation, for our city. And it is really not a time that we can be complacent anymore, that we can just carry on with our lives and our children, our jobs, because, you know, everything, nothing touches us. It hasn't come close to us, you know, so it's okay. It's, it's not okay. It's not okay. The Lord warned then, and the Lord is warning us now, if we hear today, we must not harden our hearts. We must hearken our hearts and soften our hearts and ask the Lord, Lord, what do I do in this season? What do you want me to do? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Maybe we can't go out into the nations, but where does he want you to go? Where has he placed you? He has a purpose. He has a time you have been placed in such a place for such a time as this, as Mordecai, as, as, uh, as uh, it is said in the book of Esther, as Mordecai said to Esther. We are in the book of Zephaniah. It is an amazing book. He is a minor prophet, not because he has three chapters. But um, he is just one of the 12 prophets that had a, had, had a lot to say in just a little book. And um, uh, he was sent about 25, 30 years before the Babylonians came and took captivity, uh, the Israelites. Um, uh, you learned last week about um, uh, King Hezekiah and his rule. And King Hezekiah was a good king. Okay, he was a good king. He was a king after God's heart. He did what the Lord wanted him to do. But after King Hezekiah came a very evil king, a king called Manasseh. He was so evil, it is treacherous to even read of the things that he did. In the book of Judges, you will find everything he did. He turned to the cultic worship. He, he erected all the Ashtarath poles. He brought in Baal worship. He was evil evil, evil, evil. He brought in the worship of Molech, which is called the abomination of abominations. Um, that was basically uh, a god that they worshipped. came from the Amorite, uh, 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 um, Ammonites, and they worshipped him by placing their children on his arms and setting fire in his belly. So the children were consumed. So basically, child sacrifice. You stand and you think, oh my gosh, that's horrific. The abortion clinics do the same thing. Everything they worship then, we worship now. The Baals, the Asherats, and the Moleks, we worship now. Of course, in a very sophisticated tone. Not in the same. 
We don't have a big golden statue that we go and cut ourselves and dance around. We don't put our children on Molech's arms. We don't do those things, but there are very sophisticated methods that we do worship these idols, and it is current. So he was an evil, evil king, and he reigned, and... He, you know, what is really sad is that God called his people and he brought his people so that his people would be a light. You know, he says, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bed or a table. They put it on a high place so that it might shine and the world might see the light and the world might be transformed and the darkness might be uh, invaded by the light, right? But what happened was that God's people mingled with those who were not of God and became so much like the world that you couldn't really tell the difference between the world and God's people. And you think this is not a current message. You see what happens? It's the same. We have to be inclusive. We have to be open-minded. We have to go with the flow. And so you can't tell the difference between a Christian or a non-Christian. We are Christians. Right? God brought them in. It is God who brings nations. It is God who moves nations. It is God who raises kings. It is God who brings down kings. It is God who is still on the throne and he is still very much alive. Amen. His name is Jesus. You know, in the book of Amos in chapter 9, he says he brought his people out of Egypt. And at the same time, he brought the Philistines out from Crete to Canaan. Philistine is what is called Palestine. Philistines were always, has always been a thorn in Israel's flesh. David took care of the, Israel, uh, of the Philistines. Solomon had to deal with the Philistines. We are still dealing with the Philistines, but pray for the Philistines. So much so it's become a proverb, you know. You talk about it and he's, he's such a Philistine. But pray, because they need a deliverer too. They need salvation too, Right? So then after Manasseh, there was a, God, uh, a king called Ammon, and he was a very weak king. He was only on the throne for two years, and he was murdered. And because um, he was murdered, and the one who was, successing, uh, who was uh, the successor of the throne was Josiah, and he was only eight years at the time, but Josiah took the throne. And I can't imagine what it would have been like for an eight-year-old to rule, but there was a high priest called Hilkiah, and he was under the high priest, so he was a good king. And at the age of 20, he had removed all of the Asherah poles, and he had done what the Lord had asked him to do. And he had brought back the worship of God, the true God of Israel, back into Jerusalem. But Israel and Jerusalem was too far gone. They were too far gone. They could not let go of their idols. They could not let go of, you know, the fertility gods, the, the, the Moleks, the Baals, the Ashtarats. They couldn't let go of them. They, it, had it had become ingrained in their living that they didn't see what was wrong with it. You see, it's always been when you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. See, we don't erect statues in our houses. We don't fall before things and say, you are my God, you are my idol. No, you don't. But we have plenty of things like God with everything. From Cheryl's prayer this morning, you know, it, everything. He just, and, and the worship and, and communion, everything. He just ties it up. Idol worship, but we have plenty of idols. Everything we place before God, everything we have time for other than God, everything that takes precedence other than God is an idol. We go through an entire 24 hours, and how many minutes of those 24 hours have we spent with God? And, and, and we think we don't idol worship. We have placed so many idols, and we don't idol worship, we think. It's a real good time to take stock, church. It's a good time to take talk, stock. You know why? Because I don't know what's wrong with my tongue this morning. Gordon and stock. 
God, he is coming soon. He really is. And it is not a time for idol worship. It is not a time for complacency. It is a time for God's judgment. God sent his prophets and he sent judgment because he is righteous and he is holy and he will judge. If he does not judge, he is not God and he is not good and he is not righteous and he is not the king. Because he is all of this, he will judge. He will come and he is coming again. And we need to be the people that will understand the times and align ourselves Stand watch, take our post, call out to him, repent, and do what he asks us to do. We are too busy. We are too busy. Have you heard of Watchman Nee? Amazing man of God. If you get your hands you must on, on a book called Love Not the World, you must read it. You know, he talks about, as Christians... Um, education and philosophy and culture and commerce and all of those things are great but the bible says that everything in the world is of the one who is ruling this earth and so when we step into these realms too for academic for all these things that we want to attain and gain and and walk and all of those things remember that you are touching the things of him who is not of the the uh, uh, god's kingdom he is of the, the prince of the air. Tread very carefully when you touch those things. Tread very carefully. All those things are his. We don't think anything of it. We think, oh, we're Christian, but it is, you know, it's our God-given place. Yes, I'm not telling you that you don't walk in heavenly favor. I'm telling you, you do, because you are the head and not the tail. This is true. But when you tread, tread lightly. Let not pride into your hearts, even through academics and commerce and uh, cultural things and great things that we can attain and achieve. Be careful. Be careful. Because we can take even those things. We can take even those things. So... He talks in Sephaniah, the day of judgment on Judah. That's what he's talking about. First, he talks about the judgment that is coming on Judah itself. Then he talks about the judgment that's coming on all of the nations that have afflicted Israel. It is the same story today. His judgment will come. He who has touched the apple of his eye, judgment will come. But we must stand in the gap. We must pray. And then he talks in chapter 3, it's amazing, where he tells you, I am the God who has judged. I am also the God who comforts you. And this is the story. You know, Sephaniah Sefan, is actually pronounced Sephan Yah. Okay? Sephan is to be hidden, and Yah is in Yahweh, God. And when you read the story, he tells you that he was actually, Sephaniah was actually um, a prince. He came from the king's line. He says, the word of the Lord which came to Sephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, the king Hezekiah, right? So he's actually a grandson of Hezekiah, right? Great grandson of Hezekiah. And I wonder why he was named Sephaniah. Maybe because Manasseh, Manasseh um, uh, sacrificed kids, children, in the valley of Hinnom, which is also Gehenna. Um, maybe his mother had to hide him, and that is why he was named Sephania. He was hidden in God. But that is our promise too. He says in Sephaniah uh, that God hides us. And this is true. When we dwell in him, he hides us in him. And even when there is much chaos and much harm and damage around us, when we take um, refuge in him, when you dwell in him, he hides you in his shadow. He hides you under his wing. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So I will stretch my hand against Judah and against all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of the Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests and those who have bowed down down uh, on their housetops to the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, who is also Molech, and those who have turned back 
from uh, turned back from following the Lord and those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. He is bringing ju- he's speaking judgment after those who have not inquired after the Lord. You see, it's not that, that we can just live like we always lived. If we don't seek after him, there is judgment. Do you know why God brought the Philistines into Canaan? He said in Deuteronomy, I have given you my commandments. I have told you my statutes. I have laid down before you my law. And I have also brought the Philistines here. But if you live according to my law, if you live according to my ways, if you live according to statutes that I have called, if you come to me and remain holy, you will rule over the land. But when you do not, and if you walk away from my statutes and my testaments, the enemy will uh, uh, come over you. He will take over you. Same story today. If we walk in him, if we walk under his shadow, if we walk aligned with him, he who is in him, if you abide in me, Jesus said, abide in me like a mother carries her baby inside her womb, abide, that is to abide, not a Sunday abide for two hours, not a prayer meeting two hours and a Sunday abide, my gosh, four hours of the week, that's more than what I can give the Lord. Other people only give like half an hour mass. I'm doing four hours. That's generous of me. I have other things to do, you know. I have a big garden to mow and children to take care of. Karate on Sundays, ballet on Saturdays, uh, soccer on Sundays. Uh, I have so many things to do, you know. We need to put him first. We need to put him first. It is time that we drew, we drew from all our idols and we put him first. You know, many times we wait, you know. Had a call from a friend Son went for soccer practice, never knew what, um, uh, what this was going to be. Got a call at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, somebody was, uh, had to be substituted in the soccer um, team, and they were given some kind of tablets because they were supposed to ha- it's supposed to be, uh, be uh, enhancing uh, their um, uh, performance, and uh, it was, uh, he had OD'd. It can happen just like that can happen just like that. A kid who's never gone anywhere, done any substance, just like that. And then, Lord, why did this happen? Lord, why? How? Lord, Lord, where are you? Yes, he says, seek me in the time of trouble and I will hear you. But he says, abide in me. Abide in me. If you are in me and my word lives in you, then you ask me for anything. Then you ask me for anything, not just when you need a sugar daddy, not just when you want a genie in a bottle and you want to just rub it three times and ask for three wishes. Doesn't happen that way. When you first come to him, he answers. He gives you a quick, you know, because he's just gotten your attention. But as you progress and progress, the more you wait in him, the more you wait on him, he will tell you the secrets. He will tell you that you don't even have to look left or right without hearing his voice. It is time where he is speaking. He is speaking, like in the book of Job, where he says he he is speaking through dreams, he is speaking through visions, but we are complacent. We are worshipping our idols. We are worshipping our busyness. Sometimes we are just busy doing things for God. But we don't have time to spend with God. It is time to spend time with God not just doing things for him, because in the busyness of doing things for him, we lose him. We lose him. Take time to sit with him. I heard this preacher the other day, I can't remember who, who, what his name was, he said when he was an early Christian, he said he would just read the word till he could just stand on one, one place where he felt like God was talking to him. So he would just sit down and he'd say, Lord, till I hear from you, I am just going to read your word. And he would just read. And he said, I didn't understand everything I read, but there were places where I would just come and it was like I my, could, my feet couldn't move. It was like lead and I just stayed there because I felt like the Lord was saying something to me from here. We need to be a people that's thirsty, that want to hear from him. Not dial the number and say, Pastor, what is God saying to me about this, Pastor? Can you pray, Pastor? No, he is not God. God speaks. He doesn't have favorites. He says, I am not a, 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 I've lost the word, respecter of persons. Thank God, mothers. They read your minds and know your scriptures. 
he's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't have favorites. He doesn't just speak to the pastor. If we will humble ourselves and repent and wait on him, we will hear from him. He speaks. He will speak. He will tell you how to bring up your children. He will tell you where to go, when to go. He will speak. And when he is quiet, just wait on your knees. There is a reason. When he is quiet, there is a reason. Just wait on him. Just wait on him. It's amazing, you know, before I, I can bring the word to you, he will always bring the word to me. He will always bring the word to me. I've had a really uh, hard week, and he has just been amazing through this book. He has been just so amazing through this book. It is one of those books that he says something so radical, and I have read it so many times because it used to be Andy's favorite scripture when she was little and she was in high school. And um, she used to have it drawn. She used to draw, and she had this uh, little girl s sleeping with music notes wrapped around, and it was her favorite scripture from Zephaniah. And I had known Zephaniah's scripture so long, but today, you know, he speaks to me differently from what I knew him 10 years ago. Today, he speaks to you differently. He wants you to hear him. He wants you to listen in because he has something to say. You know, I, uh, you know, sometimes people don't like reading the Old Testament because there's so much judgment and God's anger and fury and this and that. But you know, what we don't understand is the same fire that brings judgment is also the fire that brings purification. And the Lord wants us purified because he is holy and he will only be regarded as holy by those who call, come near to him as holy. You see. So long enough have we mingled things and watered his word down to make it inclusive and to make it look like we're a part of the world and we belong and we need to know, we need to let people know that we are not really leaving them out. So we are kind of mixing and matching. We need to stand out for him, not with our noses in the air, but we stand out because his standard hasn't changed. He is holy. He is holy, and he will be regarded as holy by those who call on him. So he talks about idolatry in the first chapter, and he talks to us, he talks to them about the, the Moleks and the Baals, but he's talking to us about our idols. And I don't know what your idols are. I don't know what takes precedence of your time. I don't know what takes priority in your life. I don't know what takes up most of the majority of your hours. I don't know that. But I know that I can get very busy, and by the time I sit down to spend time with the Lord, I'm like, speak fast, Lord. Seek him early if night time isn't good. Seek him in the night if you are rested and you have time to stay up with him. If you are not fresh enough, go have a shower, refresh yourself, and then wait on the Lord. Don't give him the remnant of your day. Don't give him the remnant of your hours. Give him the first fruit of your hours. Give him the first fruit of your energy. Give him everything that he deserves. He is to be reverenced. He is holy. He is love like no other. He is eternal, almighty. He is God who is so good. He is God that is so good, so, so good. This whole week, I have just been blown away by how he loves. I have just been blown away by his love that is just so personal towards me. And I'm not saying this so you feel that I'm highly favored. I'm telling you, he has no favorites, so you should feel the same. He favors you. He favors you. He favors you. He knows you by name. He has called you with a purpose. He has placed you in such a time as this. He has you on his mind all the time all the time. And he talks in chapter 1 about the judgment he's going to bring to Judah because of what Judah has been. Because Judah has not been any different from the Canaanites. Because Judah has become idolatrous. And because Judah has walked away from his statutes. And he speaks the same word to us. He has called us out to be a holy people, a peculiar people, a generation of priests, and yet we have not lived holy. We have lived dual lives. And God wants us to live a single life. Let our speech and our conduct be the same. That the God of integrity may be seen in everything we do. And not just when we come to church. 
In chapter 2, he talks about how he is going to judge the nations because of the way they have treated Judah, because of the way they have treated Israel. And I love this about him. He says in chapter 2, Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather. O nation without shame, before the decree takes effect, the day passes like shaft, before the burning of the anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, before. The Lord always wants us before. The Lord always wants us before. We need to be sensitive. He wants us in dreams. He wants us in visions. He wants us through his word. He wants us. He does. But we don't take heed. And then when it happens, we say, why, Lord? We don't listen. We don't listen. We are so calloused, so hard, so set in our ways, so set in our mindsets that we don't hear him. My sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. If you listen to him every day, you will hear when he speaks. Listen in every day. Your husband doesn't call you and say, this is your husband, I'm married to you for the last so many years. You recognize his voice. If he had to say that to you, then he'd be out the door, wouldn't he? You would be out the door. <laughs> my sheep know my voice. If you listen to him every day, you will recognize his voice. When he wants you in a dream, don't say, ah, must have been some movie I saw, just my subconscious. Just my subconscious. No, he wants you. And when he wants you, he wants you to do something about it. There is warfare happening. There is warfare happening. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you are aware of it or not, there is warfare happening. Did you not have streets that you walked down last week where there were cobwebs everywhere and, and uh, uh, skeletons hanging everywhere and little kids dressed up as all kinds of horrible little things coming and asking you for lollies? Did you not have this? The spirit of death is walking down your streets. What are you doing if you are carrying life and life that is eternal? What have we done? Did we walk down the streets and claim those streets for Jesus? Did we claim the suburb that we're living in for Jesus? Did we say that there are angels that are going to be here and that there are, no, there are angel armies and no spirit of death can come near my household or my suburb or my town or my street or my court? Did we wage war? What did we do? Put out lollies? did we do? You know, in chapter one, when he talks about idolatry, he also talks about complacency. He says, you have grown complacent, and that is where we are. We have go grown complacent. We are just comfortable. We are just comfortable. There's drive through for everything. We're comfortable. It's okay. What to do, child? Plenty to do, child. Wage war. Ephesians says we don't wage against what we see. It is not a battle you see. It is not against flesh or blood. You are not here by accident. You are not placed here to warm a chair. You are not in your suburb so that you can just ignore the door, tell the dog, shh, when the kids are coming. Tell them that this is not of life. Give them something. Last year, we prepared little scriptures and bags and things that we could give to their parents to let them know. Who cares if they chuck it? Maybe it's, you know, they'll take it back one day and have a look at it. It's a seed. We have responsibility. Don't just shut the door and pretend they're not there. You're not there. Seek the righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Sephania, hidden one in God. You will be hidden in the day. You know, Sephaniah is talking about this here, and the Babylonians take over and take these people into captivity and have them in captivity for all those 70 years, and he, God wants them prior. And he's also telling us this because in Revelation, it's telling us the same story again. It says there will be a day of tribulation. There will be a day of great tribulation. And let the Lord take us and hide us in him before that happens.
in Colossians 3.3 3 says, you have died and your life is hidden in Jesus Christ. We have died with Jesus. We have identified with his death, his burial, his resurrection, and we are hidden in him. But we must be the people that died to the old of us, that died to the old person, born in all newness in him and reigning in him. Reigning in him. Sometimes we go through stuff. And you know, like when you go through, you don't know, ha have you ever, like you think, oh, there's fresh air, you're going to put your windows down, and you're driving, and then there is a, a, a car that's just gone before you that has just emitted huge puffs of black smoke and, and gone through gravel, and then all you can have is just gravel coming in your car, and the, the, the smell of smoke and gravel coming in your car. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes when you go through life, like a film, these things settle on you. These life and what you go through, the trauma of what you go through, settle on you. But when we identify ourselves in him, we realize, you know, it's not just what, that we are born again and it's not just us. We are, when we are baptized and when we come out of those waters, it's not just us in newness of life. It is us in the newness of our culture, of our her heredity, of, of our, our generations, uh, generational things that have, we have carried. It's all of that that is now reborn in the newness of Jesus Christ. And what is reborn, he hides in him. He hides in him. But if we will spend time with him every day, he will wash us with his word. He will wash us with his word and there will be newness in our spirit. Otherwise, we're going around carrying the same old stuff that we have carried all those years through our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and we, we, we identify with all these things. You know, the things we hated most about our parents, the things we hated most about our grandparents, we become the very thing because we don't let go and let the Lord's word wash us and cleanse us and keep us hidden in him. He says he has, we have died with him, we are buried with him, we are resurrected with him, and we are hidden in Jesus Christ. We are hidden in Jesus Christ. And in chapter 3, he talks to the remnant of Israel. And he says, but I will leave among you a humble and lovely people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. This is talking about the time when Jesus will come again and rule. Um, and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of uh, Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgment um, against you. He has cleared away your enemies. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will quieten you with his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. He will shout over you. Do you know what his shout over you is? It's a song. It's a song. The Amplified says he will sing over you. He will quieten you with his song. You know, sometimes we go through rejection and we go through trauma and we go through so much stuff. If you ask just a random lot of people, what do you think God thinks about you? Some of them will say, oh, I think God's mad with me. I haven't spoken to him for a long time. God's sad with me because I've done so many bad things. God's, God doesn't really even think of me. You think all of these things, but God wants you to know this morning. He wants you to know this morning. Yes, he has judged your sin. And it was judged on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he judged your curse. And he who hung on the cross became a curse so that you can have life. He has judged you and he has redeemed you. He has called you by name and he comforts you by being in your midst and singing over you. I wanted to take comfort in this. This was my comfort. This was my comfort. It doesn't matter what happens in life. He sings over you. He is present in your midst. He never forsakes you. He never leaves you. 
he sings over you. He rejoices over you with song. Can you understand this? Can you even get a glimpse of what this really is? You might have thought you were never, never worthy of anyone's love. But the God of Israel, the Lord God who redeemed you, the one who called you by name, the one who came after you, the one who pursues you still, the one who loves you with an everlasting love says to you, I am in your midst, in the midst of your turmoil, in the midst of your bad marriage, in the midst of your bad decisions, in the midst of your bad situation, in the midst of your consequences from your bad decisions, in the midst of every trouble, in the midst of your kids going crazy and your life looking crazy, in the midst of everything, I am your God. If you will just let me be, you know. He says, draw near to me and I will draw close to you. So the closeness of the relationship really depends on you and not God. You know, sometimes people come and say, I don't know what God is doing. I just don't know. Well, if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. If you keep drawing near to him, he will keep drawing near to you. The more closer you draw, the closer he will draw to you. It is in your hands how close your relationship with is with him. If you only draw to him five minutes when you're driving, he hasn't got a lot of time to draw. Make time. It is not time for the church to be idolatrous. You don't have Baals at home and you don't have Ganeshas and Vishnus at home. You don't have any of those things. But your idols may look very different. Your idols may even be your job, your career, your children, your husband. I don't know what your idols look like. But whatever they are, it's time to bring them down and to place him on the throne that he deserves. Give him first place in your heart, in your life, in your time, in everything you do. He deserves that praise. He deserves your clap offering. He deserves it all. No one else. He deserves it all. So when you raise your hands and when you sing, let it be with all your heart for your king because he deserves it all. You know, we go for shows sometimes, music shows, and we are, you know, so overjoyed and we are dancing and singing. When we worship, I will worship you. I want to tell you something this morning. When he rejoices over you, that's not how he looks. That's not what he looks like. I bet you that's not what he looks like. The, my Bible says he shouts over you with song. He shouts. He's not just going. No. He's rejoicing over you. And you might look at yourself very differently and you might think I'm no one that anyone should rejoice over me, let alone God. But he sees you not because of what you have done. He sees you because of what he has done. And he has clothed you with a garment of righteousness. And it doesn't matter if what you have done looks bad or good or mediocre or terrible. He has clothed you with pure garment that is white as snow. You, though your sin has been like scarlet, though my sin has been like scarlet, his robe is white as snow. And his love is perfection. And his love is everlasting. And his song over you is love. And he is in your midst, in your situation, in your circumstance. You know, church, um, I was speaking to a brother this morning who was... Um, um, in, in Thailand, uh, ministering to people. And he said, you know, they are very open, he said, because they have been praying to some God, so, and they have not heard from any God. See, we don't have a God who doesn't hear. We have a God who says, he who made the ear is not without hearing. His arm is not too short that he cannot reach. He never slumbers, he never sleeps. This is our God. Cry out to me in your day of trouble, and I will hear you. Draw close to me, and I will draw close to you. This is our God. This is our God. And he has comforted me in the hardest of times. And I tell you, you will hear his song over you, because it quietens you in peace. It quietens you like no other music. I had a friend of mine, where he, uh, her, her husband can't sleep unless he hears, uh, he cannot calm down or he can't go to sleep unless he hears water. So they have an app on the phone where there's water running all night long. She gets up and goes to the toilet all night long. <laughs> but he sleeps all night long. He quietens you with his song. I know, I know. 
he quietens you with his song. You don't need a nap. You don't need a nap. You don't need anything. He quietens you with his presence. He quietens you with his song. He quietens you with who he is. He is God who is shalom, perfect peace. Perfect peace in your mind, perfect peace in your spirit, perfect peace in your flesh, your body, your soul, in everything. He is your righteousness. His blood is your righteousness. He reigns in our midst. He reigns in your midst, in your circumstance. Let him be the God who sings over you. Let him be the God who... Mela, can I have that scripture so that we can insert our names and we can read that bit? Can we read together? But you put your name in there. Okay? He will quiet me with his love. He will exult over me with joy. That scripture. Zephaniah 3.17. It's a good scripture to write and put on your fridge, on your work desk, send to your friends. It's a good scripture. It's a promise. And the God who promises keeps his promises because he's not a man that he should lie. And then, shall we read? The Lord, our God, is in our midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over me with joy. He will quiet me in his love. He will rejoice over me with shouts of joy. Some scriptures will say he will rejoice over you with song. Depending on your version. And this is what I want to leave with you this morning. He is a God whose shout is in our midst. His shout is over you. His song will quieten you with his peace. May you hear his voice and may you quieten your soul in his presence. May you walk knowing that this is the God who rejoices over you and there is no shame in him. Your past he has wiped away. Everything he has for you is good. He rejoices over you with song. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your precious word over us this morning, that you shout over us with your loving, loving songs, that no one has loved us like you. No one can ever love us like you. And Lord, let your people hear your voice. Let your people hear your voice. Let them rejoice in the king that rejoices over them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.